blessing to my heart to sing that grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious songs sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fixed upon it mount of the
Wonderful, wonderful. Good morning, church. This Palm Sunday, we are going to open up with our first hymn called, Are You Washed in the Blood? Hymn number 229. If you will take your hymnals and join me, we are going to sing hymn number 229, Are You Washed in the Blood? Thank you. Uh, good morning, Calvary. Good morning. My name is Chris Anderson, and I serve on staff here at Calvary. Uh, student pastor. Very, very excited for that. Um, very excited that you are here this morning joining us in worship. If you've not joined with us before, we'd love to find a way to connect with you, for you to connect with us. There's a QR code in the little uh, pocket, pew pocket sleeve in front of you. It's like a little white tab. You can take out your phone and scan that QR code and it'll take you to a link for ways for you to get connected to us, different events and things like that. Uh, so we would love for you to do that. Um, yeah. I have a few announcements for us as we move forward in worship. One, it's a big day. It's an exciting day. We have Spring Fest <laughs> today. There we go. Uh, this will be at the venue uh, today from 3 to 5, and this is a great opportunity for our Calvary family to gather, but also for all of us to invite neighbors, to invite friends, right, to invite our family. Just a time for us to gather together in preparation for Easter, which is next Sunday. Be reminded that we'll have three services next Sunday instead of two. There'll be an 8 o'clock, there'll be a 9.30, and there'll be and 11 o'clock. And so this particular service will be at 8 o'clock. Right, so Spring Fest, 3 to 5, leading up to Easter next Sunday. And lastly, we'll have our senior adult lunch this Thursday. You can register on the church website on the events page. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm going to pray for us as we continue in worship. Father, thank you that you sent Christ that you sent your son, uh, that we may all be washed in the blood of Jesus, you know, washed in the blood of the lamb, and 
Father, thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for hope. Father, as we enter into Holy Week, God, we pray that, you know, the rhythms and the prayers and the ways that we all choose to participate in what Christ has done. Father, we pray that um, the Holy Spirit would use these songs and these messages and these prayers to reveal to us the truth of who your Son is. You know, Jesus said when he would be lifted up, he would draw all people to him. And so, Father, our prayer is that with our songs, with the prayers, with the preaching of the scriptures, God, that your son would be lifted up and that every heart, every mind, God, we would see Jesus. And Father, we pray this not just for our uh, community and our family here at Calvary, but God, for our friends for family members who do not yet know Christ, God, for students on the campuses and in the schools, for our coworkers. So Father, help us, teach us, lead us as the sun is lifted up, that we would worship Jesus and then go out and share the good news of who Jesus is. And so Father, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
were the whole realm of glory mine, <clears throat> it would be nothing compared to him who died on the old rugged cross. If you can take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 230, we're going to go back in time to 1913 when this hymn was first composed and sung. Can you stand with me and sing along with the old rugged cross? daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Father Dominic Buckley of the Diocese of Orlando wrote about the use of Hosanna, saying that Hosanna simply means save us in Hebrew. But in the nearly 3,000-year-old biblical tradition, it stood as a one-word prayer calling out for a Messiah. We sing Hosanna on Palm Sunday when we celebrate Jesus' dramatic entry into Jerusalem during the original Holy Week. We hear the crowd saying, Hosanna, son of David, and we join in because we believe Jesus is the chosen one, the Messiah come to establish a new age of God's grace. In short, we say Hosanna because God has answered our one word prayer with a one word response, Jesus. Pray with me, please. Father of grace and mercy, on this day of celebration, a day of triumph, but also a day that began Christ's last steps to the cross, we come to you in humble thanks for the unfathomable sacrifice you made for us. As we enter this holy week, help us remember what Christ endured. He was betrayed, he was humiliated, he was subjected to an unjust trial, he suffered physical and emotional torment, and eventually, physical death, all to save us, all to take on our sins and descend into the depths of darkness instead of us, so that we might live forever in light. But today, we sing Hosanna. Today, we declare the triumph of the King of Kings. Today, we ask for renewal. 
Today, we ask you to save us from our very human weaknesses, from our pride, from our greed, from our selfishness, from our sharp tongues, from our hypocrisy, and from our prejudices. On this day, commemorating Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, let us be both weak enough and strong enough to acknowledge our need for salvation and rejoice in the mercy of our Deliverer. As we gather our monetary tithes and gifts at this moment, help us also give the other talents you have provided us, those even more precious than money, time, effort, compassion, forgiveness, love. And let us celebrate by being channels of light and blessing to the world so that everyone may see your glory and receive your grace. We sing Hosanna, save us, as we pray all this in the name of Christ who lives and reigns eternally. Amen.
do you believe that Jesus has done everything needed to save you? Praise God. And are you willing to go wherever he calls you and do whatever he calls you to do? So good. With that, it is my joy, sister, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's go. Man, well, isn't that exciting, church? I mean, what an exciting day um, to be worshiping with you guys. We celebrate a baptism with our college students from uh, a previous Wednesday night. Beautiful choir today, orchestra. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I am extremely grateful for the job that Christy and Ann are doing in leading our choir and orchestra. Would you thank them? And, uh, and I am excited about Spring Fest today. So um, my knees are going pretty bad, so you probably won't see me jumping in a bounce house. But I may get my face painted. Who knows? We'll see what happens this afternoon. Um, well, it's good to be back uh, up here teaching. I was out of the pulpit last week as my father-in-law uh, was here and was preaching in my place. And um, that was a real treat for me. I want to thank you guys for welcoming him so kindly, but it was a real honor to share my uh, platform with him last week, what a gift that was. But, you know, he mentioned that in, in his sermon last week that in 2010, he had a severe heart attack. Um, and that was a scary time for us. When that happened, Rebecca and I had been married for about a year. Uh, we were living in North Carolina. I was in class one day. I was in seminary, and I got a text message from her. This was back when text messages cost money to send. Do you remember those? And she said, hey, this doesn't look good. Um, we need to go. And so I left class. I rushed to our apartment. We got in the car and we drove straight to Montgomery uh, from Raleigh, North Carolina to Montgomery where my uh, father-in-law was in the hospital. And truthfully, there were a couple of days where it looked like he wasn't going to make it. And we were preparing ourselves for the worst. And I remember one day in particular, we were in the cardiac ICU waiting room at the hospital and Rebecca's entire family was there. Steve's closest friends were there. And uh, I remember a man by the name of Chet Williams. Now, I know this is Alabama Crimson Tide land, um, but Chet Williams is the uh, chaplain of the Auburn University football team. And him and my father-in-law were good friends. And Chet walked into the waiting room. He came to visit Steve. And if you know anything about Chet Williams, a godly, godly man, and he asks in the waiting room if he can pray for our family. And we said, of course. We said, yeah, please. And so we all grab hands. All of the, the, uh, my family, uh, Rebecca's family, we grab hands. We're in a circle in the cardiac ICU. And Chet prays a prayer that I can only describe as being full of the Holy Spirit. The kindness with which he prayed it, the faith with which he prayed it, the intensity with which he prayed it. I mean, it was a powerful moment as... Rebecca and her family, we were all holding hands, and when he finished, um, we were all just tears in our eyes, we were all moved, and, but when he was finished, we looked up and we realized that we weren't the only ones holding hands anymore, that the entire waiting room, and now this is a cardiac ICU, so everybody in there is dealing with worst case scenario, and we look around, and the entire room, strangers, are holding hands, weeping. It was one of the most powerful spiritual moments of my life. It was one of those moments where through the prayer of a righteous man, we sensed the presence of God with us. I don't know if you've ever been in a room where the presence of God was felt tangibly, but that's what this felt like. And everyone in the room was moved to tears, except one kid who was completely immersed in his Nintendo. And I just remember thinking, kid, you missed it. You missed it, man. You missed something powerful was happening in your midst, the very tangible presence of God, and you missed it because you were preoccupied with something so trivial as the Super Mario Brothers. I said, you missed it. And you know, today is Palm Sunday in our text of Scripture. We're taking a break from 1 Peter these next couple of weeks. Um, but our text is Luke chapter 19. 
And in this text, we see in in Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, we see that there was a day where Jesus was in the midst of his people. Something powerful was happening. But because the people were preoccupied with their own expectations and desires, they participated in the moment, but they missed the significance of the moment. They missed the significance of what Jesus was really doing in their midst. And I want this text to challenge all of us today to not be so, as, as we enter into Holy Week, to not be so preoccupied with our own pursuits and our own desires that we miss what Jesus wants to do in our lives and what Jesus wants to do in our world. And so what we're going to do today, I'm just going to walk through the text and then we'll have a point at the very end. But let's just walk through it. Luke chapter 19, verse 29. It says, When Jesus drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet. So this is the Mount of Olives. And right here, this is where Jesus, when he would come to Jerusalem, he would stay on the Mount of Olives. This is where Jesus would sort of set up camp with his disciples anytime they were in Jerusalem. He had spent hours with his disciples in the Mount of Olives. He had spent time with them. Tears had been shed. Meals had been shared. Jokes had been told. But this time, there's a sense that something was different. Jesus knew that his time on earth was coming to an end and that he would soon be crucified. And he knows this is one of his final moments with his disciples. And at this moment, we know that Jesus knows what's going on because at this very moment, he instructs his disciples to do something that in effect set off the chain of events that would lead to his death. He said that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks of you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. Now there's a lot you could say about that text right there, but essentially what's happening is Jesus knows what's going on. Jesus is sovereign. Jesus knows all things. And he knows that down the mountain, there's a colt that's never been sat on, that the owner is going to be generous enough to give it to the disciples so that he can sit on it. Jesus knows all things. And he knows that riding on this colt is going to be the very thing that sets into motion his crucifixion. And it says, so those who were sent away, so those who were sent went away and found it, this is verse 32, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And Jesus gets on this colt. Many translations say donkey. The word in the original Greek is polos, which is like a little donkey or a small horse, right? This isn't a great stallion, right? I'm imagining one of those mini horses at the county fair, you know, little Sebastian. That's what I mean. And the point is this, this is not the type of mighty steed you would expect the king of the Jews to be riding into Jerusalem as he coronates himself as king. You would expect a king to be on a large horse, towering above the people. But he's, here he is on this little polos, a modern-day equivalent. I mean, I want you to see just how absurd this is. A modern-day equivalent might be something like Joe Biden or Donald Trump riding down Pennsylvania Avenue on a child's moped, Right? Knees all up in their ears, their elbows all looking weird, looking like the guys from Dumb and Dumber. You know, I mean, it would be absurd, wouldn't it? It's an outrageous visual to think of a dignitary, a president, a king, someone with authority to be riding on something that looks so silly. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's riding on a small polos, which probably meant he was moving very slowly, too. Jesus was probably dragging his feet on the ground. He would have been eye level with the people, not towering above the people. See, Jesus is doing kingly things, but he's doing them in unkingly ways. This is very humble. It's very meek. It's very understated. But all of it is to fulfill a prophecy from Zechariah 9, which says, Your king is coming to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, riding on a donkey. Like those two sentences, those two phrases don't go together. Your king is coming to you, righteous and victorious, lowly riding on a donkey. Strange kingdom that he's bringing. Not only that, Jesus brings an entourage with him. 
You know, you expect a king to come in surrounded by soldiers, with a band playing, with powerful people, maybe some celebrities. You expect an entourage when somebody powerful shows up. But Jesus enters Jerusalem with about the most ragtag bunch of people you could ever imagine. He enters Jerusalem with the disciples, a bunch of fishermen, tax collector, a zealot, um, perhaps probably some other people he's picked up along the way, people that Jesus had healed or ministered to or probably following him as well. I, I think Zacchaeus may have been there with him because Zacchaeus, uh, the story of Zacchaeus happens earlier in Luke chapter 19. So you got a little short little Zacchaeus with giving his money out. You know, he, I mean, you've got, he, he's got this entourage of just this unexpected people. Jesus is doing kingly things, riding into town in, on a, with a parade, with an entourage, all very kingly things, but he does so in an unkingly way. This is what Jesus does. He combines majesty with meekness, authority with humility, and power with vulnerability. Jesus is unlike any king that has ever gone before him, and the people don't yet understand what's going on, but they soon will. And Jesus rides into Jerusalem. The people are worshiping him. It says in verse 36, as, they, as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. He was drawing near. Already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So one of the things you got to understand about this moment in time is this was Passover. So people from Jerusalem, uh, so people have come to Jerusalem from all over Israel. The population of Jerusalem was probably three, four, five times its normal size. Some scholars estimate that up to three million people were jammed into Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is not a large landmass city. I mean, the streets are jam-packed with people. And all these people are laying down their coats and they begin praising Jesus and they celebrate him. Other gospels say that they took palm branches and they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, which as Amanda said means, save us, please, now. And it says they praised Jesus for all the mighty works that they had seen. So perhaps they had seen and heard of Jesus' miracles and they said, Hosanna, he's come to save us. They saw him feed the 5,000. Oh, he's, he, 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 he can bring prosperity. They saw him heal the sick and the blind, and oh, he, he can heal all of our ailments. And they're celebrating Jesus for all the things he's done. And you think of the expectation they must have felt. And the truth is, we can't even begin to wrap our minds around the excitement and the expectation that they felt because we're modern readers and we're not completely engrossed in the culture of first century Jews. But to the Jewish mind, this isn't just a one-time event. They're, in their minds, they were connecting all of the dots. Prophecy, Zechariah 9, riding on a colt. They're starting to believe that it's coming true. The Messiah has actually come. And their hopes are beginning to rise. The Messiah, he's come, he's going to save us. Hosanna. And for these people, this was the biggest event in their history. And it came with all sorts of expectations tied to it, though. This is what they've been waiting for for centuries. And so in their excitement, there's this fever pitch of all-time high excitement, and they shout, Hosanna to Jesus. This is not a trite expression of honor. This is them saying they are placing all of their hopes, their dreams, their expectations, their fears, their longings, their desires onto him, and they're saying, save us, please. And of course, the religious leaders hear this, and they're like, uh, no, 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 Jesus. You better do something about these people saying all these things. And some of the Pharisees, verse 39, they said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, listen, I tell you, if these people were silent, the very stones would cry out. And you know, you often hear skeptical people ask, they'll say, did Jesus actually claim to be God or is that something his disciples claimed after his death to start a religion in his name? People will often ask that question. It's a good question. But right here we see Jesus, one, receive the praise of his people. He doesn't rebuke them. If he was not God, I mean, he would have said, oh, no, 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 don't worship me. Don't worship me. But he doesn't rebuke them. He receives their praise. And he tells the religious leaders, he says, if these people stop praising me, the rocks will start praising me. He's saying, all of creation shouts my name. 
See, this is a claim of deity. He is claiming that he's the creator and the sovereign author of all things. He's claiming that he's the Messiah, that he alone is worthy of the praise he's receiving. And these people, they're going crazy. This is a celebration of Jesus. But Jesus, he hears it all happening, but Jesus knows what's going on, and there's something weighing heavy on his heart. So he stops. Verse 41 says, it says, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, I've been to Jerusalem a couple of times in my life, and one of the most moving places in all of the Holy Land for me is taking this journey from the Mount of Olives down into Jerusalem. Because you're up there on the Mount of Olives, Jerusalem is down sort of in the valley, but as you wind down, you're up on the Mount of Olives and you take this winding road that takes all these twists and turns, and you're kind of, the, the city is blocked from view, but then there's this one point where you turn right on this winding road, and all of a sudden, the city of Jerusalem comes into view. And uh, Luke even says, he says, when he drew near and saw the city. Luke is saying, and he's saying when Jesus took that right turn, and when he saw the city of Jerusalem, Jesus was stopped in his tracks, and he begins to weep. The city is staring him in the face, and he begins to weep. Jesus is looking over this city that he loves, these people whom he loves. And even though the people were worshiping him in the moment, he knew that very soon they would reject him and that they would even call for his death. And one of the things that is so important about Palm Sunday is that before the cross, before the empty tomb, there is a sobbing Savior knowing that he must die for the people who will reject him. Palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week. And the Palm Sunday is the beginning of Jesus weeping for his people, knowing that he must die their death in their place. And he weeps, Luke tells us, because he knows they'll face harsh judgment. Forty years after Jesus' death, the Romans would lay siege to the very city Jesus is looking at. They would destroy the temple and cause the horrific deaths of countless Jews. You go to Jerusalem today and there are still stones from the original temple that were destroyed, still laying there. And Jesus wept because he knew that what the people wanted Jesus to do was to be a political savior. And he knew that he came to be a spiritual savior. And he knew that they they were going to face judgment. And he wept for this. And his heartbreak went beyond just the 40 years after his death. But he wept because he knew they were going to reject him and that they would enter into an eternity separated from him. And he's weeping. Because these people will reject him. And the question is, is why? Why will they reject him? Why do shouts of Hosanna become drowned out by cries of crucify him within just a week? And it happens because Jesus wasn't the type of Savior they expected. Jesus came to bring one thing, but they wanted something else. He was a king, yes. And he was bringing a kingdom, yes. But it wasn't the type of kingdom they wanted. And I think many people today... Reject Jesus for the same reasons that these same people that these people rejected him two thousand years ago, and it's this: we often miss Jesus because he doesn't give us what we wanted. See, they missed Jesus because he didn't give them what they wanted. You see, they expected Jesus to be the kind of they wanted to be the Messiah, but they had expectations, very specific expectations for what a Messiah would do. And what a Messiah would accomplish. And it didn't have anything to do with dying on a cross for their sins. It had everything to do with Jesus destroying their enemies and making them great. They weren't looking for a spiritual Messiah who wanted to save them from their sins. They were looking for a political Messiah who would humiliate their enemies. They wanted a political Savior, not a spiritual one. They wanted a Jewish Messiah, not one for the whole world. In other words, they wanted to give Jesus what they wanted. And when Jesus didn't deliver, they turned on him. In the other Gospels, this story takes a turn very quickly. Jesus rides into Jerusalem with all the fanfare of the Jewish people. You think they're expecting him 
And you get this sense that they're expecting him to just ride down the mountain, storm into the uh, gates of the city, and go straight to Pilate's fortress where the Roman governor was and start a revolution. This is what they were expecting. The Messiah has come. He's about to overthrow Rome. He's about to do the things we've always wanted him to do and start a revolution. And Jesus starts a revolution, but it wasn't against Rome. He didn't go to the Roman part of the city. You know where the first place Jesus went when he entered Jerusalem? The temple. And he started flipping over their tables. Jesus wasn't coming to slay the Romans. He was coming to slay their sin. And in that moment, it starts to become clear to the people that Jesus wasn't the kind of Messiah that they expected. And just a few days later, they're calling for his execution. And the truth is, we're not so different, are we? We often look at Jesus as something we can add to our lives. We, we have our life. We want it to be a little better, so we add Jesus to it, hoping that he'll make things good. And we treat Jesus like a genie in a lamp or a cosmic vending machine. If I accept Jesus, if I pay my tithe, if I say my prayers, then I expect him to do this or that for me, right? So church attendance, coin in the thing. Say my prayers, coin in the thing. You know, uh, pay my tithe, coin in the thing. Okay, now I turn it. Okay, now I get the blessings that, God, that Jesus wants to give me. We often treat God this way. And it's when we do this, it's not actually Jesus that we're worshiping. What we're worshiping is our own desires. We're just using Jesus to get what we really want. And this is what the people in Jesus' day were guilty of as well. And this is why he wept. It's often like we use Jesus as a pinata. If we got to hit him up to get the candy, we'll do it. But what we really want is the candy. And the point of the Gospels is, and the thing that we often miss is, is that Jesus is the candy. He's the gift. He says, come to me, and I will give you the desires of your heart. What he's saying is, he is the desire of our hearts. He is the gifts, yet we often only treat him as the dispenser of gifts. You know, a while back I saw where one of those TV preachers, ooh, those guys, You want to get me red in the face. I saw one of those TV preachers posted on social media to his millions of followers. This is a direct quote. Do you need a car? Today, make the decision to take that car by faith. Say, thank you, Lord, for my luxury car. Lord, I see myself in that luxury car. Thank you, God. I believe it. I've received it. And I have it. And I'm taking it by faith today. I'm here to tell you today, church, that is dangerous theology. And I believe this man will be held accountable for such blasphemous statements. And you say, well, what's wrong with those statements? Well, what's wrong with that is these, this statement is inviting people to believe in promises that God never made to us. And the problem happens when his listeners ask for a car... They claim it by faith in the name of Jesus, and then they don't get it. And then the question is, is, who looks bad in that moment? Who looks bad? Who do they become disappointed with? They become disappointed with Jesus for not giving them a car that he never promised to give them in the first place. And they walk away disappointed with Jesus because they thought he would give him this one thing, and when he doesn't, they walk away disappointed. And the truth we often miss is this. Jesus is so much better than any material possession. Jesus is so much better than creature comforts. Jesus, he is so much better than any political victory you can hope for, any better than any pleasure you seek. And this is why Jesus started weeping when he looked over the city. Because even though they were praising him, he knew their heart. He knew that their expectations would be shattered when he doesn't humiliate Rome like they had hoped. And when they see him bound and subjected and executed by Roman soldiers, they walk away from him disappointed because he wasn't the Jesus they expected or they wanted. And to their shame, they were consumers, not disciples. They love and praise Jesus for all the mighty works he did, but when it looks like those works will cease, their praises cease. And I know many people... They will come to Jesus because something has been broken in their lives. Relationships, sickness. They come to Jesus looking for hope. They think maybe he can make things better. And you know, this is how I became a Christian. 
Because I believe that Jesus offered something that I was missing. But sometimes Jesus gives us hope in ways we don't expect. Sometimes he doesn't restore the relationship like we desire. Sometimes he doesn't heal our child like we prayed so desperately. I can attest to that. Sometimes he doesn't give us all the things we want, but what he does give us is so much better. He gives us himself. And he shows us that on the cross that he loves us dearly by dying for us. He defeats our sin and our death when he rises from the grave. And he sends his spirit to comfort us and guide us. And he promises that even in the storms of life, he will be with us. And that when he returns, Satan, sin, and death will be vanquished. And he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And what these people wanted was for Jesus to save them from Rome. But Jesus came to save them from a far greater enemy, which was death itself and their very sin. Jesus is better than what they imagined. But they were so disappointed because he wasn't what they expected. And they, could, and they missed what was happening in the moment. You know, every day I drive from Northport into Tuscaloosa. And when I come over that bridge, I get a glimpse of the city. And when I look out over our city, I think of the heart of Jesus. You know, everyone who lives in this town, the students, the people just trying to make a living, people just, I mean, there's all of us here in this city. And I think of Jesus, you know, what would it be like if he went up that bridge and kind of saw the skyline of Tuscaloosa in the same way that he saw Jerusalem? Would he be weeping? Would he be wondering, what are we hoping in? What are these people of Tuscaloosa, what are they hoping in? What do they believe will give them fulfillment and joy? And even when I look out over this congregation, or even when I look at myself in the mirror, I think, what is it that we really want? What is it that I really want? Do I want my own kingdom? Or is it his kingdom that I want? Will I follow him wherever he leads? And I wonder what Jesus thinks as he looks out over us and over my life. You know, in Jerusalem, at this precise spot where the city comes into view, there's a church that's been built. It's called the Dominus Flevit Church, which means in Latin, the Lord wept. And it's this beautiful structure. It's in the shape of a teardrop. We have a picture of it, I think. This is the church. It's at this very site where Jesus looks over Jerusalem. And it's in the shape of a teardrop. And when you go in the church, the way it's structured, there's light that comes in through the top. And it, you look up, and it, the architect designed it in such a way that you feel like you're inside the very tear of Jesus. And it's this beautiful, just it, it, this architectural, just beautiful thing where you just feel like you're there. And then at the front of this little church, there is a, a communion table. And it overlooks the city. There's a window. And as you take communion... You look out to the city and interposed in the window as you look out over the city of Jerusalem is a cross. And years ago, I remember sitting in that church and I was moved to tears. This idea that Jesus would look out over the city and not only weep for it, but that he would see the cross as he looked out over it. That he would lay down his life for this city. And I think about my own life, all the times I've rejected Jesus in actions and in thoughts. I think, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. You know that song? Everybody sings that part loud when it comes because we all feel it. And I think of an image of Jesus looking over my life, seeing all my failures, and still weeping for me, still dying for me. And that thought rushes into my mind. And I become so grateful that even in my rebellion, even in my rejection, Jesus loved me enough to give himself up for me. You know, on the cross, as the Romans scourged Jesus and the people who once cried, Hosanna, shouted, crucify him, Jesus still mustered up the strength to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And my question for us today is, will we receive that forgiveness today? Or will you, like the kid in the hospital room, miss the moment because you're occupied with lesser things? Gardner C. Taylor, one of my favorite preachers of all time, he said, I trust myself to these tears of a sobbing Savior. Do you? I throw my frail heart with all its doubts at the weeping Son of God. I place my hopes, all of them, in the strong hands of Him who openly grieves and sobs for me. Christ weeps and my heart melts. 
Christ weeps and my will is broken. Christ weeps, my head bows. Christ weeps, my knees bend before Him. Christ weeps, my life is His. Christ weeps, that wins me forever. Does it you? Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, we thank you for Holy Week. And we thank you for Palm Sunday, the day where this whole thing was set into motion. And God, I pray we would not be like those who worship you one day and then walk away disappointed the next. God, I pray that we would see you as the ultimate gift, not the gifts you give. And God, you give gifts. You love to give gifts to your children. But may we not miss the gift giver because of the gifts. God, I pray that this Palm Sunday, we would see you as the most worthy thing. And as we enter into Holy Week, God, that we would um, be filled with gratitude for the cross and hope from the resurrection. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Church, would you stand? We're going to have a song of response. And as we sing, would you come however you feel left? standing as we dismiss. I just wanted to give you guys a couple of things. Uh, One is, uh, it is Holy Week. And so we are kicking that off today with this service, but also Spring Fest this afternoon. We have Good Friday, um, this Friday at noon right here, and then Easter three services. A couple things, if if your HOA allows it, okay, don't break your HOA or anything. I don't want anybody in trouble. But if your HOA allows it, if you grab one of these on your way out, Stick this in your yard, stick this on your property somewhere, maybe your business or something. Um, the statistics show that, you know, people, they, you can invite them to church over and over and over and over again, and they're not interested, not interested, but they're, they'll come on holidays, and Easter's one of those holidays. So that family member who you've invited a million times, try again this week and see what happens. But also, your neighbors, they may be looking for a place to worship this Sunday, next Sunday. And so I'd encourage you to grab one of these on your way out um, and stick it in your yard. I also would encourage you just as a sort of a reminder this week, just to set your hearts on Jesus. We've got a little, uh, we've got palms that you can pick up as you leave here today. I would encourage you to take that palm, stick it on your kitchen table. As you get your morning coffee, read your Bible in the morning, that you would just remind yourself that Jesus is the Messiah, the King who has come. And we can say, Hosanna, save us, because we know that he has through the cross. Calvary, thank you for worshiping with us today. Go in grace and peace. We'll see you guys next week.